Yeah. Are you going to be in the classroom? Just for a little bit. There was some okay. Like Brianna, can you um, watch the phones until Sharon? She's going to be in the classroom in the beginning. <coughs> Thank you. All right, you guys ready? Yep. Yes. All right. Uh, <coughs> we are uh, starting a sermon series, a two-part sermon series, a short series, but um, Angel had said he was going to Portland, and next week he's going to Fresno. Wow. So he says, he goes, I'm not going to be able to preach, because usually we switch off every other week. So um, when I knew I had two Sundays, I'm like, oh, yeah, because I've been waiting to hit a series. So I'm like, thanks, Angel. <laughs> I'm waiting to hit the series because there's no way I could do it in one sermon. And um, so uh, I took it, taking advantage of it. So I'm calling this sermon series, uh, The Fall to the Cross, What Happened? Um, I don't know if it's going to be what you consider a full-blown sermon. It's part teaching. Um but I think this is real, this is, this is foundational stuff, foundational stuff, you know, and um, if you, you, you already know that if, if you have a house, re real quick, you want to start decorating it, but if it's built on something faulty, then what good is it if it's decorated nice if the foundation isn't solid? So we want to make sure that we understand what really happened from the fall to the cross. And it, I believe it, it takes two parts to really, really get it, uh, that understanding in there of what truly happened. Because most people will say, oh, the fall, yeah, I know, Adam and Eve, and they ate the fruit. And man, there's something more, much more deeper that happened. You know, and, and that's like what I wanted to be able to express. You know, and um, so we're going to start off with this. The first part being the fall. And the second part, is the cross which is next week so you guys ready yeah. all right lord god i thank you so much for this chance this opportunity to share your word lord i thank you so much i give you all honor and all glory you are the senior pastor of this church and this is your pulpit lord i thank you lord in jesus mighty name jesus, amen. 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 all right the fall to the cross part one uh, before we get into the verse, I just want to just start off with this, saying obviously we're going to start in the book of Genesis. Genesis, if you don't know your Bible, is the very first book of the Bible. This is the very beginning. And basically, you know that God um, made this perfect paradise, made this perfect place. There was no sin. There was no wrath, no violence, no hate, no anger. There was, it was a perfect place that God created everything and, and called it good, according to Scripture. Uh, there was no... And I, want to I want you to remember these three things, because these three things are going to carry over from this week into next week. Sin, condemnation, and guilt. Sin, condemnation, and guilt. There was no sin in the garden. There was no condemnation and no guilt. What's condemnation when you feel condemnation, when you feel condemned. There wasn't none of that. It did not exist in this place. It wasn't there. No sin, no condemnation, and no guilt. And we know according to scriptures that after God made everything and he saw that it was good, that he created man. The Bible says that he took the dust from the ground and, and he created man. And it says that once he was created, he breathed into him the breath of life and Adam became a living being. So we, we, most of us, I'm pretty sure, know that story, even when you were children. And that's kind of where we're going to start this. Is, is, is Basically, I want you to think of it as we're, we're taking a microscope of this scenario of what happened. And then we're going to back up and see the whole picture. You know, a lot of times you see those uh, movies or music videos where... It'll show two people talking, all of a sudden the camera goes way high up, and they're in the middle of a city. And, and that's what we're going to do here. We're going to start with Adam and Eve, and we're going to um, be able to revert back and be able to see the whole picture of what exactly happened at the fall. I, I think we need a deeper understanding, and I pray and I hope 
that you're going to hear answers to questions you have or questions that maybe you didn't realize you had until you hear the answer, and then you're like, oh, that's crazy, that makes sense. You know, and, and you're gonna, I pray you're going to hear something that maybe you've never heard before that helps. You know, all of us, I believe all of our walks are like giant puzzles. And, and like you have a lot of the pieces that somebody else doesn't have, and somebody has pieces that you don't have, and, and we all have pieces to this puzzle. And why do you think fellowship is so important? Because we complete the puzzle. You know, but I, I pray that through this sermon, it's able to add some of the pieces that have been missing in, in your life and in your walk and in your understanding of what it is that we have coming against us when the fall happened. So this is leading to the first verse. Um, Abraham, can you do the next clip? It starts with this. Genesis 2, 16, 17 says this. And this is, so Adam, Adam became, became a living being. Eve wasn't in the picture yet. So God spoke to Adam. He spoke to the man. And this is what he tells him. He says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Who was God speaking to? Adam. Was Eve in the picture yet? No. So who was the command given to? Adam. 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 Okay. So his command is given to Adam. Then the Bible says right after that, that Eve was formed. After that command. So whose job was it to tell Eve this? Adam. Was it God's? Yeah, it was Adam. He told it to Adam. And it was Adam's job to tell Eve. But before anything happened, right, Adam and Eve, they had this thing called their identity. Of who they were. There was no question about it. Remember, there's no sin, no guilt, no condemnation. They knew who they were. They had nobody, to, they had nobody else to relate to but God. He was their example. He was their example. Why do you think a, a, a child that, that, that grows up and they say they're, they're the only child in the home, they have no other kids to, to learn from? Well, actually, use this example. The second child always learns how to talk quicker than the first one because they have bigger brother, bigger sister, and they're always together, so they learn to speak faster. You know, But it's like <clears throat> when you take that out of the equation, the first one usually takes a little longer to learn how to talk. But then they have certain characteristics about themselves, certain ways, because all they know is their sibling and their mom and their dad. But once you put them in preschool, all of a sudden you notice your kid starts acting different. Because he had nothing else to relate to but mom and dad, but now he has a whole classroom to relate to. And some of those other kids are just bad. Not your kid, the other kids, right? Yeah. It's always the other kids. Yep. So all of a sudden, that, that child starts to take on the char characteristics of other children. Adam and Eve had nobody else to take characteristics after but God himself. So they were, they were perfect in their walk. They were perfect. They have no condemnation. Does, the, does God have condemnation? No. no. Does God have sin? No. No. Does God have guilt? No. Exactly. So Adam and Eve didn't have sin, no condemnation, no guilt. They walked about as if God, because he was their example. This is the perfect place. And everything was good. As long as, Adam, you were given orders, you can have anything you want here, just don't eat from that tree. And he was supposed to tell Eve the same thing. That was his, that was his, his duty. That was his authority. Because even Scripture also, not only does he have identity, he, is, he has authority. God said, you know what? I'm going to make you in my image. Well, God reigns. Right? God reigns. So he wasn't going to make Adam, he's, he's not going to say, I'm going to make you like me, so I'm going to make you a servant. No, he goes, since I reign and I want you to be like me, then you're going to reign too. So he gave him authority over the earth. Matter of fact, he says, I want you to name the animals. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. You tend the garden. I'm not going to do it for you. You tend to it. So Adam and Eve, they knew who they were. They, they related to God. They acted like God. They talked like God. And they had authority like God. God. But all of a sudden, as we know the story, things didn't go so well. We know that. 
that, that even though Adam knew who he was and Eve knew who she was, all of a sudden, and, and here's another question, is we see Eve by herself away from Adam, away from her husband. We don't know where Adam was at. But we do know in this next verse, Abraham, in Genesis 3, 1, 6, it says this. I'm just going to read it and then we'll talk about it. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So there's a, there's a serpent. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the serpent hits Eve with the question. Hits her with the question. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Good job, Eve. You quoted your husband. Because that should have been what your husband had taught you. Because God spoke it to Adam, and Adam should have spoken it to Eve. So I applaud her. She spoke what her husband had said, because God had told it to Adam. <laughs> but then, it says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This verse brought the entire existence of man into a huge whirlwind, a spiral downward. Basically what happened is the serpent is basically insinuating to her that you aren't like God. Didn't we just read or know in the scripture where God says, I will make them in my image. Mm -hmm. So basically the enemy was trying to sell her something she already had. She already had the image of God. She already had it. And actually in other scripture it says that she was deceived, that she was tricked because there was no sin in the garden. <clears throat> There was no condemnation. There was no guilt. There was no manipulation. You know, matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I uh, forgot what verse, but it says that, that um, love believes all. There was no reason for her not to believe because there was no lying in the garden. There was no, 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 no uh, manipulation or anything like that. So she hears the serpent. And, and, and he, he, he twists it up and basically says, no, man, if you eat it, then you'll be like God. And verse 6 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. <coughs> she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Another thing, little, little pointer that I trip out on, did you notice God didn't come and basically condemn them until Adam ate? God didn't show up when Eve ate. I wonder, just, just a little side note, I wonder, let's say Eve, Eve had eaten it and she would have brought it to Adam and said, hey man, this tastes really good. What if Adam would have been like, what are you doing? And corrected her. There was room for correction still. Oh, but Adam, he wants to be pleased his wife all the time. That's what men want to do. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so what does he do? He starts to obey somebody that he shouldn't have been obeying. He disrupted this thing because it was God, Adam, and then the woman, and it got turned. All of a sudden, instead of obeying what God said, he obeyed what she said, and he ate it. All of a sudden, she eats it. Boom. All of a sudden, now they're running and hiding. So what happens at this point? Is Adam and Eve, they lose their identity, and they lose their authority. They completely lost everything that was given to them by trickery, by manipulation. And they no longer, it's crazy because the Bible says that God came into the garden. They heard the voice of God come into the garden and they ran and hid behind bushes as, as if a bush can hide you from God. 
And God says, Adam, where are you? And I've always found that funny because do you really think God didn't know where Adam was? I mean, that bush could have been that big. So there's, there's a deeper question here. There's a deeper answer because there was no way that God was really wondering, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. You know what, what was happening was this, was the very fact that God recognized Adam because Adam acted like him. But all of a sudden, he sees Adam and he ain't acting like him anymore. I'll give you a perfect example. I've said this example before in identity classes. I said this, how many of you have ever had somebody fall so far into addiction that they no longer, rep, uh, uh, you, you no longer recognize that person anymore? How many times have you sat with somebody that you love that has been just completely hooked on meth or heroin or whatever, and you just want to shake them saying, I know who you really are. Where are you? You know, Adam fell in something worse than heroin addiction, worse than alcohol, worse than those things. He fell into sin, and God didn't recognize him. He says, Adam, where are you? I don't recognize you anymore. Who are you? The person that you're being, why are you hiding? Well, because I'm in shame. I didn't teach you shame. Who taught you shame? You didn't get that from me. Well, I'm hiding because I feel condemned. I feel embarrassed. You didn't learn that from me. I made you in my image. I don't hide from no one. No one condemns me. Why are you acting this way? Who, are you, who has taught you something different than me? And after this, on earth, with mankind, came shame, condemnation, and guilt. From that moment on, man became full of shame and condemnation and guilt. And it's just a crazy thing that happened. And, you know, and, and let's, let's pretend we're, we're talking about two things, right? We're talking about here on this earth, and then we're talking about, let's say, the spiritual world. Because there is a spiritual world. So when this was happening on the physical earth, in the spiritual realm, the kingdom of darkness, what happened in the kingdom of darkness? Well, all the rights, everything that was given to Adam and Eve, all these rights were switched over. And a new king reigned on the earth, and it wasn't Adam anymore. The kingdom was seized. The the the. The place was seized. The authority was seized. And a new king reigned on this earth. And the kingdom of darkness now permeated the earth and infected everything in it. The earth was infected. Life was infected. <laughs> Humanity was infected. Everything was infected with, with this kingdom of darkness. It was just came like a cancer, a disease, a stain an infection and infected everything from that point on. Matter of fact, in the next verse, Abraham, Romans 6.23, it says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, things went really bad. Somebody had taken our, our right as humans, as humanity, took our rights from us and we were reigning because Adam was reigning and Eve was reigning and that was taken from us and, in, and by default, therefore, made us servants of the new king. <laughs> so humanity became servants of the new king that was now reigning, the one that manipulated humanity out of its authority and changed its identity. So mankind took on now. At first, mankind had the identity of God. Adam and Eve acted like God, talked like God, uh, um, um, reigned like God, had authority like God. All of a sudden, their identity changes, and now humanity now has the identity of Satan. Humanity takes on the identity of Satan. Hopelessness, lost, wicked, hateful, full of wrath, disobedient, liars, blasphemers, murderers. That's what we took upon ourselves. So from the time of Adam, there was a God that ruled this earth. And he became the landlord 
by deceit and by manipulation <coughs> and by trickery. Mm -hmm. yes. Everything changed. Everything changed from that moment on. You know, we know according to scripture that fallen angels make up the ranks of, of, of the enemy. We know that a third of the angels followed after Lucifer or Satan and, and, um, and they followed after him. Fallen angels. So, because during the sermon, we we're talking about what was happening with us, and then we're also going to be hidden upon what's happening in the spiritual sense in the spiritual world. So, in the heavenly places, in the spiritual world, these angels became fallen angels. When God created everything, they had their own place. I'll give you a nice example. Okay. Um, a fish doesn't just start flying. A bird doesn't start swimming. They know their place. A bird knows its place. It's in the air. A fish knows its place. It's in the water. God created things to operate as it, as it does. You know, God didn't create a, a, a lion, and all of a sudden that lion wants to just start grazing on grass like a cow. And cows don't just get, man, you know what? Cows aren't looking around like, man, I feel like eating some lion meat and just go after lions. <laughs> God created them in their character the way they are. Mm -hmm. Why am I saying that? Because angels were created a certain way. So this is, this is interesting because people don't talk about this. But if demons are fallen angels, they were created by God to operate in a certain way. Mm -hmm. This might be the first time you're hearing stuff like this, man, so just bear with me. Angels were created to operate in ranks. How do I know this? I will show you biblically because the Old Testament continually gives God this title, the Lord of Hosts. How many of you heard that term, the Lord of Hosts? Yes. The Lord of Hosts, you might have read it, but don't know what it means. Host means army. That he's the Lord of armies. He's the commander of armies. That God is the commander of armies. Well, what else is heaven other than angels? He created angels, and he's the Lord of hosts. He's the God of armies, the Lord of armies. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that angels were created to be in ranks in the same way when you go to the service. There's a private, there's a colonel, there's a sergeant, there's, you know, I don't know exactly how it goes, but, you know, there's titles, and there's different ranks. Uh -huh. So they were created to be in ranks. That's how they were. Then they were, they were created to operate in their proper ranks like soldiers. You know, the Bible talks about things called thrones, dominions, principalities, rulers of the darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Remember where I said that word host means? It means armies, right? So this is what scripture says about the enemy. They have thrones, dominions, principalities. You know what a principality is? You're like, there's a king and there's a prince, right? And that prince, he has an area that's his principality. That's why it's called principality. He's a prince. So according to scripture, the enemy has thrones, dominions, principalities. So if there's principalities, that means there's princes in each area of those principalities. You guys following me so far? Mm -hmm. There's principalities. And then it says rulers of the darkness. And then it says spiritual host. Spiritual armies. Host means armies. Spiritual host of wickedness, spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. So they were created to operate in their proper ranks like soldiers. So everything, so let me say this to you right now, and, and if you think about it, you're going to agree. So everything that angels are, demons are the same thing except one thing. They're unholy. They're still angels, but they're fallen angels. They're not holy angels. They, are no, they have no holiness in them anymore. But their character, what they were built to do, what they were made to do, the fish was made to swim, the bird was made to, to, to fly, angels were made to be informed in ranks. They were hosts. They were armies. They were soldiers. They had rankings. It's interesting that scripture describes the enemy and the powers of the enemy as thrones, principalities, rankings. So there's a difference. Angels are all the same, but some are fallen and they're unholy. 
And because they're unholy, they follow, they don't follow after God. They follow after Satan. That's their God. That's who they follow after. You guys follow me so far? Okay. Trip off this. Did you guys know that some demons in the fall were so wicked that they weren't even allowed to walk on this earth? There are demons that are so bad that they have never walked this earth. And somebody might say, man, man, but there's some crazy stuff. You talk about Hitler. You talk about, I mean, just insane stuff. And there, how many of you know that all that was just demons? Who do you think was in Hitler? Was, was it the Holy Spirit that was in him? When you see the uh, masses of people being killed and murdered, and to think that those demons were the ones that were allowed, because there was worse ones that have never been allowed. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to show you scripturally. Actually, the next scripture. Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I, ha I have it on the message. Do the next one. This is a little easy to understand. Same verse. It says, Later he destroyed those who defected. And you know the story of the angels who didn't stick to their post. Abandoning it for other darker missions. But they are now chained and jailed in a black hole wow. until the great judgment day. Sodom and Gomorrah, which went to sexual rack and ruin along with the surrounding cities that acted just like them. So according to Jude 6, there are demons that abandon their post. Because why? Because they're made to be in ranks. These demons, even though that they even though they fell away from God, they had ranking in the kingdom of darkness, and they didn't even want to obey that. And they just went so far that God says, you know what? I'm throwing you into solitary confinement. You guys, there you guys will never roam the earth. You guys are so bad that that's the worst of the worst. It's it's like Supermax. Sam Quentin. Death row. No chance of parole for these guys. And we think the earth is bad. Imagine if these guys were out and about. But according to scripture, why did they get thrown in solitary confinement? Because they didn't stick to their post. They didn't stay in what they should have. Yeah, anybody? Is that new to anybody? Yeah? Okay. So that's what Jude 6 says. Check this out. Look at the next verse. Abraham, next verse. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Here we see it again. That these guys, these guys are the shot callers. You know what's crazy? Is Satan himself roams this earth. How many of you guys know that? Scripture says. Mm -hmm. These guys are worse than Satan. Because Satan's not in solitary. These dudes are. Mm -hmm. These guys are worse than Satan. But we just saw two verses, Jude 6 and 2 Peter, that confirms what I said. If God did not spread the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So... There's three things I want to say before I go on. Angels are created to operate out of structure, orders, and rankings. We know that. We read that. We saw it in 6, that they left their post. They're, they're, they, they're, demons are not like, hey, just go and just run and cause havoc. They know exactly what they're doing strategic. Why? Because they were created like soldiers. Don't for any minute think that, that demons are not plotting against you and I. If they were created to be soldiers... They are well-defined soldiers. They don't sleep. They don't get tired. They don't get hungry. They continually want to destroy you, your family, my family, my children, and everything else that we have. They want to destroy our homes. They want to destroy our jobs. They want to destroy our health. Yes, Amen. yes. Amen. And they're plotting. And they're strategic. So it doesn't make any sense to be a Christian and just be nonchalant about it. Man, that ain't going to work out. Amen. It ain't going to work out, man. So we know that angels are created to operate out of structure, order, and ranking. 
We know that angels that don't stay in their own rank, they've been cast into chains until judgment day. We know that angels are designed to obey orders, whether fallen angels or holy angels. All they know is authority. If you ask a soldier, hey, at ease or whatever, you know, orders they do, they're just like, who are you? But let a general come. Uh -huh. What do they do? Boom! You know, they, whatever they do. I don't know. Jennifer laughs when I salute. Where are you at? Good again. Right? When, when a superior would come, what would happen? You stand at attention. Right? You respond like that to authority. What if just some civilian came? No. <laughs> exactly, right? But if somebody superior comes, you guys knew your orders. Angels. Remember I said, the only difference is they're unholy. They understand orders. Why do you think you shouldn't argue with an enemy? Why do you think you, you realize who you have in you? Do you realize that all they know are orders? And when somebody superior comes into the room, they are going to obey those orders. That's why I don't argue with demons. I command them because a general lives inside of us. Amen. 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 See, this is what I'm talking about. When we start understanding this foundational stuff, you should, see, be, you should see demons come out of people all day long because when you start to understand who lives inside of you, yes. you got to understand these things are soldiers. They are soldiers. They're unholy soldiers, but yet they are, they are made to listen to authority. Okay. I need some water for this next part. <laughs> Good stuff? Good yeah, stuff, yeah. Pastor. All right. Now, keep all that in mind, right? Because remember what we're talking about. This whole thing, we're talking about from the fall to the cross. We're talking about what happened at the fall. There's another thing that, there's another part of it. Keep all that in mind. I want to talk about ambassadors for a minute. I want to talk about ambassadors, okay? Um, <clears throat> did you know that if we were having trouble with the country, um, at least before there's a conflict, that country usually has an embassy here in the United States. We have many embassies in the United States from different countries. Sometimes we're not good with that country, but we're not at war with that country. But while we're not good, their ambassador, their embassy is still here in the United States. Yet we're having conflict with them, let's say. Right? There's conflict rising above here and there with Russia, but we have Russian embassies here. Right? So we have embassies. And in that embassy is an ambassador of that nation. And that ambassador can come here to the United States and walk around the United States, even though we might have conflict with that country. Because he's an ambassador, a representative of that country or that kingdom. Did you guys know that an ambassador actually has access to the president? If there's an ambassador of France or, or England or whatever, they have access to the president of the United States. That's crazy power. Because they they're not even citizens. They're not citizens, yet they can walk into the White House and have an audience with the president. But they're ambassadors of another country. They, don't, they are not United States citizens, but yet they have an embassy here. In their embassy, they can operate any which way they want, for the most part. But they're ambassadors. Well, did you guys know that an ambassador can travel back and forth between his country and the White House, and, and many times they can actually, if we're having conflict with that nation, many times they can actually come and accuse us of stuff. So here we are in the United States, and this ambassador from this other country has the audacity to come into the United States, be in his embassy, go see the president, and start talking bad about Americans. And the president doesn't do nothing, right? Because he's listening to this ambassador making accusations about whatever it is that he, he has a problem with. Okay. You guys ever heard of something called full immunity? Full, full immunity, this is crazy, right? Did you guys know that diplomatic officers in that embassy and their deputies and their families, that ambassador can basically commit any crime in the United States and he, they can't arrest him? That's insane. 
You can be an ambassador of some other nation, come to United States, go through red lights, jaywalk all you want, beat people up at a bar, and they can't touch you because you have uh, diplomatic immunity. Is anybody is that new to anybody? That's insane. So this person from not the United States can come over here, wreak havoc, accuse, and nothing happens to him. Okay? I'm not here to talk about politics. This is going to tie in, man. They, they're immune from prosecution. They can't be arrested. They can't be forced to testify in court. Nothing. We see a perfect example of this in the book of Job. What do we see? We see God in the throne room. And all of a sudden, here comes Satan. Comes wandering in like he's cool. Uh -huh. And he goes, uh, hey, uh, have you considered Job? You know, because uh, I, was, I was back in my kingdom. Because remember, the earth is his. I'm back in my kingdom. There's this guy, Job, that actually worships you. And God's like, yeah, I love Job. He goes, yeah, well, of course he worships you because you give him everything. You bless him with this and that and all these things and, 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 you know, this whole story of Job. And basically what he does is he goes and he accuses. It's like him going into the White House and making accusations about somebody else. Knowing that he has full immunity. Knowing that nothing can happen to him. Knowing that even though there's a conflict of light and dark, of the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of God, even though there's this conflict going, it's not out war yet, so he can go and still go and accuse and say things in the throne room. See, a lot of people get confused. and like, how was it that Satan was in the throne room? How does that happen? Well, this is exactly what was happening. Actually, the Bible calls uh, Satan the accuser of the brethren. So when I see that, the accuser of the brethren, brethren is plural. So he didn't just accuse Job. That means he was constantly in the courtroom of God snitching on the people. Constantly. Constantly going from his kingdom of darkness into the throne room, accusing people, because the Bible says he was the accuser of brethren, more than one person. Constantly accusing, accusing, and accusing, pointing fingers. Uh -huh. He was a rat. <laughs> So the enemy is just accusing. But he had uh, full immunity. So he was an ambassador to the world, to his kingdom of darkness. And he thought he could do anything he wanted to. And the world wasn't looking so good, man. Matter of fact, the Lord says, okay, since Adam gave it up, that, that's, that's your kingdom now. And, and here's the throne room, and here's, here's the kingdom of God. So God is like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send ambassadors there to reach the people. So he would send ambassadors. Another word for those were prophets. He sent prophets. I'm going to send prophets into there because that is not rightfully theirs. That, that, that is not rightfully the, the, the Satan's land. So I'm going to send prophets to speak to the people so they, can, so they can direct their hearts back to me. Because that land belongs to the people, not to the enemy. I need to let them know that, that, that that's their land. They don't have to be servants. They don't have to be slaves of the kingdom of darkness. They don't have to, have to be in bondage. So God would send prophet after prophet after prophet. And what happened? The people would kill them over and over and over. And mankind was doomed. And nothing could be undone for what Adam did. You know, everybody here in this room, we were all slaves infected with sin. And we were caught up in this thing. And what could be done? You know, if I would end the sermon there, and if there wouldn't be a part two, then we have nothing, man. There'd be nothing. You know, this, this next verse I want to show you here in Romans. Abraham, do the next verse. 
Check this out. This is the Message Bible to make it real easy. And it says, you know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we were in? It says, first sin. Thanks, Adam. But because of sin, the wages of sin is death. Then death. Thanks, Adam. It says that no one exempt from either sin or death. No one was exempt. Everybody was infected. That sin disturbed relations with God and everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. <laughs> Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did, right? I didn't. I eat fruit, but I don't think I've eaten that fruit. <laughs> Even though none of us have done that, we still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. Because of everything that happened and everything that was taken, identity was taken from Adam, so identity is taken from us. Authority was taken from Adam, so authority was taken from us. And we were given life, and he took that life, man, and gave us sin. And because of sin, the wages of that sin is death. And we're just in a bad situation now. That last part, even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam. Because how many people say, man, I'm not a bad person? You know? The alcoholic, you know, will tell the, uh, the, the pothead, man, I'm just, I just drink beer. That's legal. You're a pothead, dude. And this dude says, well, pot's legal now. So what are you talking about? Look at this tweaker over there all tweaked out. And the tweaker goes, yeah, but I'm not shooting it up. I ain't bad as a heroin addict, you know? And it keeps going on and on and on. Prison is full of those, those guys. Oh, I'm here just for drugs, man, but I ain't like these dudes. You know? <laughs> And they say, well, I'm just here, man. I just beat somebody up because of this and that. But, man, that dude's just over there stabbing people. And then the stab, you know, I'm, I'm not a rapist. Look at this rapist, man. And this, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And people are like that, man. I'm the, David, I, I get it. I get it. You came to Christ because you went to prison. You did all this. You were living a bad life, man. So I'm glad that you were serving God. I'm glad you found a happy place for you. I'm like, bro, you don't you understand? You need a happy place, too, because you're infected, too. We're all infected. Yes. Everybody. Yes, amen. Like Walking Dead. <laughs> Everybody's infected. Airborne. <laughs> yeah, it's just. <sighs> My parents hate when I bring up Walking Dead. <laughs> it's a good example, though. You know, season one, they find out everybody's infected. Same thing. I see the gospel and stuff when I watch movies and stuff. Me and Angel, when we get together, man, we'll get the gospel out of a Mickey Mouse cartoon. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's infected, right? And, and, and if I end the verse here, it would, it, it's just sad. Because basically, this verse is saying because of what Adam did, we're through. Yes. There's no chance, there's no nothing, and, and, and we're just going to just die. But you guys know that the verse doesn't end there. Yes. So I'm going to read the last part. And then when I read that last part, Abraham, switch it over. Thank you. That last part says, even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did, by disobeying a specific command of God, still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But look at the next part. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. Yeah. That is what scripture says. Yes. That there's a one that's coming, man, that's going to take us out of this thing. So the story doesn't end there. And here's the big lie. Here's the biggest lie of all. Is the enemy wants you to believe that you are still infected with Adam as a Christian believer. That you are still that person. You're still in a fallen state. You are still condemned. You're still full of shame. You are still just... All these things that the enemy says, man, and here's the thing, right? That this is what this scripture is saying, that somebody came. Yeah. 
Yes. Because he sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and they killed other prophets. And God himself says, you know what? I'm going to fix this once and for all. Amen. I'm going to fix this thing because Amen. nobody else could fix it. How could a prophet fix the situation? No matter how good of a prophet he was, he was still infected with sin. Yes. People always say, what's the big deal? Why, why do you have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? What, what do you, why does that have to, why do you have to, that, that, that sounds silly. That sounds like some crazy, you know, Mother Goose stories. And I'm, I'm telling you why this is so key. It's because if Jesus had not been born and conceived by the Holy Spirit, then he too would be infected with the sin of man. That is why. That is why that's a big deal. That is why that is a foundational thing that Christians will stand for. We stand for that. Because if it wasn't him that was conceived by the Holy Ghost, then what do we got? We just got another person named Jesus that's also infected with sin that can't help us. But the Bible says he had no sin. The Bible says that he was perfect. The Bible says that he was unblemished. The Bible says Jesus himself says, I came to set the captive free. Who do you think he was talking about? He was talking about mankind. He's the king to set the captive free. He came to set the captive free. So, you know, it's like the sermon series. It's called The Fall to the Cross. And, and please, if you are here, don't miss next week, man. Because how many of you got a deeper understanding of what happened at the fall? A deeper understanding of the enemy and the enemy of darkness and, and the standing where humanity was before Jesus came. There was no chance. There was no nothing. Mankind had no chance. No chance. And, and, and by understanding that these things operate in ranks, you, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a saying that says, how can you fight your enemy unless you know your enemy? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and we can't fall into this whole thing of, of like, well, I'm going to learn a whole bunch about demons. <laughs> and and what, you, you can fall, you can trip yourself up, man. You start chasing after demons so much you forget who God is. Yeah. And I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this. Any, any general or soldier oh. or, or in a battle is going to know exactly what that enemy is capable of. That's right. And I think one thing a lot of you need to know, if you didn't know already, is that these demons don't operate just haphazardly and just do whatever, man. They are ranked and they're in file and yeah. they are strategic. Yes. So what does that mean? That we have to be in rank, we have to be in file, and we have to be strategic. That when we come against the enemy, that we be exactly on point the way a soldier is supposed to be. Because actually, even scripture says that we're soldiers. Yeah, We're soldiers. You know? But anyways, I don't want to start getting into next week's sermon. <laughs> so we're talking about the fall, and next week we talk about the cross. Yes. And exactly what that means and what happened, not only here on earth, we know he died, we know he was crucified, we know, but what happened in that spiritual realm, man? Because that's the stuff that will blow you away. Because we know this, we've seen the passion, we've seen all that, but what happened in the spiritual realm? Yes. So this is what I want to do, guys, right now is I want the worship team to come because this end, this verse ends with but Adam got us into this and also it points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. But there's only one. There's only one that can make that darkness, the kingdom of darkness I was talking about. There's only one that can make that kingdom tremble. Only one. It ain't a church. It ain't a ministry. It ain't an evangelist. It ain't a preacher. It ain't none of this stuff. There's only one, man. Did you know that, that this one, he comes, the one that Adam, Adam got us into this, but it points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Yes. His name is Jesus. He came to set the captive free. There's no reason for you or I to be afraid of the kingdom of darkness. How do I know that? Because the king lives inside of you. Do you know that the very kingdom of darkness trembles at his name? There's an earthquake that happens. Man, that's why you should proclaim his name in the morning. Proclaim his name at night. Proclaim his name over your family, over your children. So that kingdom of darkness will tremble. So let's worship. You guys ready? Yes. 
bring it all to peace. Let's all surround. Let's all sing. Let's all stand. Come on, man. At your name. Who's name? Jesus. Can't, can't withhold his name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. 
and worship him. He's worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Yes, Jesus. He's worthy. He wants to set you free. He came to set you free. He came to set you free. You don't have to live like Adam anymore. You don't have to be infected anymore. You don't have to live that old life anymore. He came to set the captive free. He's the one all tremble. All the doctors tremble at his name. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Holy Ghost, release him to this place right now. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let him stir in your heart right now. Let him stir you up right now. You don't have to be. You don't have to be in guilt. You don't have to be in condemnation. You don't have to be in sin. You don't have to be lost anymore. He came to set you free. He came to set you free. The enemy has stolen too much from you already. The devil has lied for you for way too long already. Satan has deceived you for too long already. He has made you a slave to him too long already. He has bound you to addictions for too long already. He's put depression on you for too long already. He's put hopelessness inside of you for too long already. He's given you sickness for too long already. He's destroyed your marriage for too long already. He's come after your children for too long already. Yes, yes, Jesus. But Jesus steps to the scene. When Jesus steps on the scene, all the kingdom of darkness trembles. Sin trembles. Every single devil trembles. Satan trembles. His entire kingdom of darkness begins to shake and crumble at the name, that sweet, sweet name of Jesus. Let that name right now shake everything inside of your heart right now. Let that name shake everything inside of your mind right now. Man, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't give sermons. I don't preach because I'm anybody. I'm not anybody. But you know what I am? I'm somebody that he set free, man. If you would understand the darkness that he gave me, that he took me out of, if you would understand what it is when I preach, when I preach. Because he set me free. He set me free, man. He set me free. He set me free. He set me free. I, I, I thought I could never escape, that I thought I could never never get away from that darkness. I thought the chains were too heavy. They were too heavy for me to break, but he came and he broke them. He came and I just said, Lord, I'm not so glad to be your servant. Lord God, I just want to serve you. I've been a slave to sin so long. I just want to be a slave to you. And he says, no, I'll do something greater. You will be my son. And I said, oh, Lord, how can I be your son? I've done so bad. I've done so many things. And he says, you are my son. I throw your sins away as far as the east is from the west. I throw all your sins away in the deepest ocean. And I throw them there. And they will never come back again. And I said, Lord, this is too much mercy. This is too much. How can you give me this much mercy? I don't deserve it. And he says, David, I will put a word in your mouth and you will speak my, my, my proclamation and my words. And when you go out and preach, more will be saved and more will be rescued and more will have a chains broken. I need you to go and proclaim my word. And he's saying that to everybody in this place. He's saying, why are you holding your mouth shut? Open your mouth and proclaim my word. 
Yo, this is what the Lord is saying today on this Sunday. He's saying, stop holding it inside. I put a word inside of you. What are you waiting for? I'm coming soon. You need to speak my word. You need to speak that word that I put inside of you. What are you waiting for? I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. All you got to do is speak that word. Speak that word that I put inside of you. I've called you, Modesto, to be a beacon of light for me. Oh, I've called you to be a beacon of light and you will reach many for my name's sake. I put my spirit in you. I put my spirit in you. What are you waiting for? You need to deliver the word that I gave you. Deliver the word. Deliver the word. I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. Deliver the word. Oh, Jesus, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord. Oh, she and I come to Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. You're so merciful, Lord. You're so powerful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Abraham, put that very first song on. The very first song. We're going to end this thing. I think it's slide number four. Let's end this right, guys. Guys, the Lord has spoken in this place. The Lord has spoken in this place, and the Holy Spirit is here right now. He's here right now and he wants you to begin to fight your battles because we have a war to win. Go ahead. Now we're ready to fight some battles. Amen. More than what we were when we came in. I hope so. i
Hallelujah, Jesus! Amen. Amen. I want to thank you guys. If you came today, please make sure you come next week. I really want to give you the second part to this sermon series. Um, if I spoke to you and asked you if you could stay, please don't forget. And um, I just want to say God bless you. Have a great Sunday and a great week. God bless. Yeah. Amen. Gotta bless everybody. See you guys next Sunday. Uh, <laughs>